On this episode, myself, Josh, and Sandy are talking to Josh Fiore, who just won the Spartan Ultra World Championship over in Iceland. We talked to him about the whole experience and him getting engaged at the finish line. Enjoy the show. We are live with episode 67 of the New England Spot and Show, and uh, I guess you could call this the Christmas edition of the New England Spot and Show, because if, as you're listening, it's probably Christmas Eve Eve. Yep. Hopefully you listen when it comes out. Um, and we have uh, a special guest with us. We, at least myself, haven't had any races for quite some time now. I'm a couple weeks out. Um, so we have with us, besides Paul and Sandy... Stop laughing, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Josh Fiore with us, and uh, we're going to talk all things Spartan Ultra Iceland and uh, Josh Fiore's life, and we're going to put him on a pedestal here and talk details and, and have him answer some questions from the crowd. And So uh, we have one yeah. question for you, Josh, before we do anything that somebody actually has asked in the group. When are you running for president? <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote for him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, anything has got to be better than Donald Trump. So, <laughs> 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 um, I'm ready to for him, yeah. <laughs> we we made it 67 episodes without any political commentary. <laughs> and we just lost 32 yes. percent of our audience. <laughs> uh, so, well, let's uh, let's jump right into it. So, um, you know, probably one of at least their most talked about events in the last several years, Spartan decided that they were going to do a 24 hour uh, ultra championship. And, and we'll talk event format and details in a bit. Um, and uh, long story short, Mr. Fiore just came just came back from winning the ultra championship in Iceland and uh, at the same time also got engaged. So quite a weekend for you. So congratulations. Uh, thank you. Um, but let's uh, let's start out a little bit about um, you know just talking about Josh how you got into the sport and um, you know where your kind of comfort level lies in terms of races and and obviously being the the champion of this ultra race it seems like distance is really your thing but talk to us a little bit about you know where you got your start and and where you see yourself going. Yeah, so I actually um, like most other OCR racers started back in 2011 um, with the Warrior Dash over in Amesbury. Yeah, um, it was, I was more there. Like a mud bath, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, then after that, I did my first Spartan race that same year, also in Amesbury, and it just like kicked my butt. Like I remember, like literally just sitting there, like I can't move um, because I wasn't running at all. You know, I, I was in the gym a lot, I was working out a lot, but I just wasn't running whatsoever. Um, it was that following year in Amesbury that I actually met Andy Weinberg. He was actually at the Amesbury race with a shirt that said death race across it. And I'm like, oh, what is that? I want to try that out. And I, he, you know, I said to I said to Andy, I'm like, oh, you know, like, have you done it? And he was like, no, nah, I'm not crazy. I'm the race director for that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, of course, in Andy style, for anybody that knows Andy really well, he said, to him, oh, you'd be perfect for that race. I'm going to give you an email for it. You, you just um, ran a sprint. So, You'll be great at the death race. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you, you just ran a three-mile race. Why don't you go run a death race for seven miles? <laughs> um, so that was really what got me into endurance stuff. And then I, I ended up doing four death races. So so wait, um, before that death race, you hadn't done any endurance racing? or you? Nothing. Okay. No. Just, the deep um, end. So, just some running when I was in the Army about 10 years prior, and that was it. <laughs> wow. That's in at the deep end, man. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was after the first death race. I barely finished. It. I was like one of the last finishers to actually run up uh, um, Blood Root. Yeah. After that, I was like, I actually got scared. I'm like, all right, I need to get better at this running stuff. So <laughs> I just started getting better at running, and then it was back in like 2015 that I really started running competitively. Um, it just kind of, yeah. So you it's, did four death races right. before you figured out that you should get better at running? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but by about 2015, I started thinking, okay, maybe I'm actually kind of good at running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's hilarious, having uh, having been around the death race a little bit, but never crazy enough to do the damn thing. Oh, God, no. <laughs> the closest I got was crewing, and that was yep. crazy enough. Yep. You know what it is? Honestly, like, I I don't necessarily miss the race. I miss the people yep. of the death race. The racers were just, like, such a close-knit community, much like OCR is and a lot like mm-hmm. the endurance um, community is it's just it's such an amazing great community and that's one of my favorite parts about it i think a lot of people found that with the death races the death race was almost more of an excuse to meet your old friends than an actual event yep. to participate in um exactly. have you uh so uh, aside from the ultra stuff have you done any of the um the endurance hurricane heat uh the 12 hour hurricane uh, heat so no i actually i haven't done any of the hurricane heat this ultra championship but yeah. um and then yeah I, I've, I've thought about doing the ago a goji a gogi a gogi <laughs> yeah. yeah and actually should i'm be- not the only one <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for using Look, traditional I've Greek. I've so many names. times online i'm like a gogi 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 Okay. <laughs> that, that's that's the first yeah, obstacle so, is figuring out yeah, how to say it. <laughs> it's actually saying it. Um, but I actually I uh, did get actually an invitation from uh from Mark actually to go to one of the next Goji's, so hopefully it should be doing one soon. They have one in Mongolia. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Done Iceland, so whatever. Mongolia is probably a step below that. Um <laughs> so so let's talk Iceland and, and let's talk the format. So uh, there's obviously a, a large contingent of people now that are running Spartan Ultra Beasts as they were the now retired Ultra Beasts. Um, oh. But this format's a bit different. So explain a little bit um, for people that haven't heard about it how the Ultra format in Iceland is different from the Ultra Beast and and what some of the unique kind of situations were around around this race. Yeah. So um, this race itself was actually it, it was it was very similar actually to World's Toughest Mudder. Um, even down to like when the race started, um, it was actually, uh, it was around a 6.1, 6.2 mile loop, um, in, of 22 obstacles, I believe, where you basically, you start out, they actually had a prologue first. You actually ran through the, the town of, how about, um, I, I apologize saying, but possibly, <laughs> nobody can pronounce any uh, towns in Iceland. Iceland. It's it's struggling with a gogi, <laughs> never mind an Icelandic town yeah, name. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> So we basically went on a 5K prologue through the town, and then we started out with the loops. Um, every loop, basically, once you went through it, there are three types of obstacles that they had. And uh, there were your classic Spartan obstacles. You know, you had everything from, like, the Tyrolean Traverse to Twister and so forth. Um, but with this format, there was mandatory obstacles, which were mostly the carries, things like that. There were loop obstacles. So, like, if you didn't finish the rope climb, you had to grab a bucket and go do a penalty loop. Um, and then some of the other penalty loops were crawling underneath uh, barbed water. And then there are the burpee penalties, which are six obstacles. And what they did for the elite racers was they had actually a passport where you actually got punched if you, you got a punch hole through if you actually passed the obstacle. Then once you actually, so instead of doing obstacles at the obstacle, at the end of each loop, you got to give um, to one of the, ref- the, at the burpee pit, your passport to the referee and whatever holes you were missing, that's how many sets of burpees you would do. Um, so they actually gave so, you, they actually punch your passport when you succeed, not necessarily exactly, when you fail. Exactly. And that, that's a very cool way of doing it in a way you cannot, how, how do you cheat that? You can't. Exactly. And that, yeah, was, that was pretty so highly awesome. regarded. The only time I didn't like the format was when I did four obstacles failed. That wasn't fun. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> because you did all the burpees at once. So it was 100. So is that 120? Was it the standard thirty? Each? So it was standard. It was standard thirty till midnight, and then after midnight, it was fifteen. So they basically oh. split it. So that was actually that was nice because it was. That is nice. Yeah, it, a lot of the obstacles. It wasn't necessarily the difficulty. I mean, like, like I said, they were your classic Spartan obstacles, so you know, pretty familiar with them. Um, it was just everything was caked in ice. You know, yeah. you, even the rope climb was difficult to do because it was just slippery and. Olympus was very hard to do. It was it was like a rubber matting on Olympus, so it was very hard to traverse across it, other than just grabbing onto the holds. But yeah, and um, and, and just as in World Service Money, you had basically a pit slash like transition area, 
this time they used like a big, um, it was basically a big soccer area, which was nice because my pit crew, my girlfriend Cheryl, was able to kind of actually relax inside a heated area. Which she, didn't really, oh, good. she was awake the entire 24 hours too, but, um, but yeah, and so then it was, the other also big difference that they had was that after 9, 9 a.m., so the race started at noon, the following day at 9 a.m., after 9 a.m., you could you could not start any more laps. Um, the Three other, full hours. That's a long time. Exactly. So the other also, so basically, if you got there at 8.58, you can be like, okay, I need to go run another lap. This is also the other kicker that they had was that if you don't cross the finish line before noon, you are not a finisher. So oh. in other words, you could do 90 miles, you could do 100 miles. If you don't physically cross the finish line, before noon, you are not a finisher. Um, so that was definitely like a, it was a mental thing. And it, we definitely went over that for a couple of weeks beforehand. Like, okay, what are we going to do if, you know, this happens or if I get there yeah, at this all time? The scenarios. <laughs> exactly. And you really, you really had to look at what your previous laps were, you know? So for example, like if you looked and said, okay, I've been, you know, doing two hours and two hours and 30 minutes. Now it took me three and a half hours to finish my last lap. You don't have enough time. So was and was it, was it, did they do anything similar to Toughest Mudder where um, they do a rolling start for their obstacles? Was this everything's open from the get go or did they? So, yeah, the only pretty much um, kind of way, and they actually spread out pretty well. Um, I believe there were around like 800 and something racers that actually started um, wow. for the distance. Um, I, I believe it was a good amount of people. And um, the prologue definitely broke things up. So having the 5K prologue without anything, just literally just running through town, mm. um, definitely broke things up. And then the only two obstacles I believe that were closed was Twister and the Monkey Bars, and that was it for the first lap. And then everything was open. Um, so there definitely wasn't really any break at all. The kids carries were every lap. The um, obstacles were every lap as well. So being and honest, how long was each lap again? Oh, go on. Uh, it was around like, it was a little over six miles each lap. Okay. About six miles per lap, a little over. Okay. And what was the, what was the terrain like? So Joe DeSena and obviously, <laughs> hard. yeah, Spartans <laughs> pushing, you know, it's, it's Iceland and there could be a foot of snow. There could be no snow, rain, wind. So talk to us about the terrain and the weather that you guys were fighting through. Yeah. So this is actually, this is my first time going to Iceland. Um, however, even before even talking about the terrain, I think being here in New England, Helped out tremendously with both. <laughs> their yeah. And you know anybody that's been ever been trail running anywhere around New Hampshire, Massachusetts, where I live, um, it's some gnarly trails out here. <laughs> you have a yeah. very rocky trails, and that's a lot of and very uneven terrain. Think you know like even like Barry, which is flat, but there's still like it's very uneven on the terrain and the grass. Yeah. Um, the the footing itself it was icy, it was mossy, it was. You know, the, the, it would all, all constantly changing. In one lap, it could be hard. The next lap, the next foot step that you take on that exact same spot, your foot goes down two feet. Um, <laughs> it was just constantly changing. And then it was even like became very sloppy, muddy near the end of the race. Um, Weather-wise, it was it was just like New England. You know, we say in New England, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. That's what Iceland was. <laughs> 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 it was it was. Pouring rain in the first couple of laps, which is probably the hardest laps. That's that's where I had 120 burpees. Um, but it was it was then it would turn to snow. It was I mean I, I've been hiking a lot like above tree line in the what in New Hampshire in the White Mountains. It was a lot like those conditions when it came to the wind and the weather. Um, the wind generally most of the time was at you the entire time. So you're trying to run and it's blowing you sideways. It's blowing you backwards. But if it was with you. You felt like you were you were a sail on a sailboat. <laughs> it was like pushing you right ahead, um, but it was just constantly changing, and it depending on what part of the course we were on. Um, How cold did on it top get? Of the mountain, it's just and the mountain itself was quite the worst part. I mean, it was it was almost like it was dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> just that careful balance of dangerous yet adventurous. So, oh, oh it was it was pretty. I mean, as mo obviously most of you know, uh, Robert Killian. Um, he's an army ranger. I, I'm actually an army veteran myself. And both of us were actually running together in the first lap. We got to the mountain part and we're climbing up and you're literally climbing hand over foot. I mean, mm -hmm. it was actually like rock climbing. You have to pull yourself up 
this cliff. Um, and both of us are just looking at each other like, you know, we should be on like harnesses and ropes for this right now. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> what was you the, know, what was the temperatures like? Guys, I'm like <laughs> what were the uh, temperatures tough. like on the, over the night? Yeah, was it, did you hit, was it freezing cold? Up? Obviously it's cold, but t- what were the temperatures like while you were out there? Yeah, it was, um, I was personally, and I, I don't know, I know it sounds kind of crazy for me. I was actually comfortable the whole race when it came to the temperature. I know a lot of people it affected greatly. Um, I actually didn't change my clothing once. Um, I literally just, I wow. stayed the same type of um, gear that I had the entire race and I was very comfortable, but I also, once again, I kind of attribute that to all the time that I spend in the White Mountains and New yeah. Hampshire, just these gnarly conditions that we have here in New England. <laughs> yeah, as we speak outside, it's snowy and miserable yeah, right now. It's, so it's, it's, Yeah, it's, it's sleeting where I am, so, you know, you go a mile away and it's probably snowing. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and um, I'm in Houston and it hit 80 degrees today. Yeah. Which is way worse than what you guys have. Yeah, oh, I would rather have this anyway. I'll, I'll go to your house, Sandy, and brush your car off for you if you want. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and what, um, you know, obviously this is something, you know, when you consider world's toughest buddy, you've got people going out to buy wetsuits, and now you're racing in Iceland. And, again, being in New England, you luck out where you've got this cold weather gear. But what did you bring for gear that you ran with, and was there any gear that you brought that you just didn't even end up using and wouldn't even consider bringing the next time you do this? Yeah, I actually, I, I think everything that I brought was perfect for this race. Um, there were some things that didn't work out quite as well as I wanted them to. Um, basically, from head to toe, I had, or from toe to head, I guess, <laughs> I had a Darn Tough Mountaineer socks, which I'm a big, big, huge fan of Darn Tough. I've yeah. used them since the death race. Um, and they're a thick mountaineering sock, and those literally the only socks I wore the entire time. My feet were comfortable the entire time. They were wet, but they were comfortable. Yeah. Um, I had Innovate Mud Claws, which were fantastic for this type of terrain. Um, for the, the one regret that I made was wearing Under Armour uh, compression tights, the winter ones. They kept my legs warm, but they didn't stay tight the whole time so there was a little bit of chafage <laughs> during yeah. the tmi right there but um now, yeah. <laughs> all, all three of us on this call understand it one way uh-huh. or another i'm sure yeah, so. I, I think everybody that's ever done an ocr understands chafe, <laughs> chafe. Yeah. And, I, and i used you know anti-chafe it was just the compression pants themselves were not the best so that that's something that i do regret having but i didn't have anything over those just the leggings um just a basic, just a tech shirt underneath with um, a Nike, just long sleeve compression shirt and um, a Brooks running jacket. And that was it. So wow. not, you, I mean, you didn't really go over the top in terms of extra gear. I mean, you wore cold weather clothing really is, is really yeah. what it boiled down to. Yep. It's, it's big. The bit, the biggest advice I can give is just layers. Yeah. Now I did have layers on top of that. We actually had a required gear list that we had to have on us, either mm-hmm. physically wearing or in, in the bag. So I had a Solomon uh, running vest, and inside of that I had a waterproof jacket and a waterproof pants. So if I did get really cold, the, and I did learn that from World Stuff as Mutter, is just having a windbreaker is like make or break it. Yeah. Even if you have a wetsuit on, it doesn't protect you from like the howling winds of the desert. So like having a windbreaker or waterproof like windproof jacket was absolutely paramount. I never had to use it, but I did have it in my pack, and I'm really glad that I did because if the race went on any longer, I probably would have needed it. But and how did you fuel yourself? What kind of uh, nutrition did you have? <laughs> Back at yeah, base. So, um, yeah, I actually use um, and I've used this since probably about two years ago when I found out about this. It was like the greatest discovery ever, and it's so simple. Um, it's just tailwind. Um, so the tailwind basically is just simple electrolytes and sugar and it's, it's a, but it's a perfect ratio. So it's not just, you know, like, like Gatorade is, is great. It has pretty much literally the exact same things. It just has a lot more sugar in it, um, or more of a balance, I should say, compared to like the sodium and electrolytes. Um, so basically just had my two water bottles with tailwind and water and then in between each lap. So when I went into the transition area, it was your classic ultra goodies, um, potato chips, pickles, <laughs> peanut M&Ms, yeah. Snicker bars, like just 
but it was nibbling by the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, things like that, but just nibbling little pieces of stuff and just getting back out there. Yeah, and, and so when you come into the transition area, so they uh, – I saw pictures of it. So they set up that dome essentially, and, and every – was that – did you come inside every lap or was it – were there times where you just skipped right over? Yeah, so actually the only time that I skipped was my first lap. So at the end of my first lap, I just went on to the second one. After that, it was every single transition. Um, I thought it was much more important to get nutrition and to warm up for literally just like two minutes mm-hmm. than to skip out and possibly, you know, either become fatigued, become cold, mm-hmm. become, you know, like kind of down in my energy. So, um, and but like I said before, like my now fiance, like we practiced this, we, we went over this for a couple of weeks prior. She did a phenomenal job of literally like feeding me and kicking my butt out. <laughs> she was literally like, all right, get back out there. Um, yeah. Because so we, I think we actually kept most of our pits around like three or four minutes, like talks. Wow. Like getting, oh, it was like NASCAR, like getting get out. <laughs> yeah, because you really can't. It, you know, as much as you want to sit your butt down and honk on an entire peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or like, <laughs> if, if you want to continue going and get back out, you get really can't do it. And, Put on and a nice coat. <laughs> and, you know, take a take a handful of something to eat and then move on. It's really the best thing you can do with these long distance races. Absolutely, yeah. You start and I, just from experience, you know, you start kind of like your muscles start to stiffen up. You start like kind of getting into the mental game of you know what, I, I can just stay here for another five minutes. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I used to see this at the Ultra Beast. I used to tell people, be like, get in, get out, guys. Like it's a yeah. trap. It's a trap. Yeah. I remember popping. <laughs> That's like years ago, like when, before I did my first ultra beast. He's like, the pit is a trap. Get in, get out, get out of there. But how, how do you keep that mental thought process going when you get so fatigued and tired? Because, I mean, everybody knows that you need to make your transitions as fast as possible. But you look at these ultra races, there's the pits, are, the, the transition area, just de- people sleeping, people oh, yeah. and cramping. Yeah. I mean, how do you mentally keep that mindset? Yeah, it's you definitely need, uh, as I said, like if, if you have a pit crew, it's awesome because they can yeah. really just let out. Um, give you a big I actually, <laughs> um, I mentioned this on a Facebook post actually on the Iceland page before the racing started, you know, kind of just giving people advice and whatnot. That when it comes to your pit crew, if you do have a pit crew at these ultra distance races, it's a democracy before the race, it's a dictatorship at the race. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, like my girlfriend, she was in charge. It's not a, ah, oh, you know, I think, but no, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's number one. Number two is just having like a reason, having a why for these races. You know, like my, you know, like my why is always changing on you know, whether it's like my son, my family. This why was obviously my now fiance, but um, you have to have some type of reason to get back out there because if you're not, then it's why, why do it? So Did you go there with the intent of winning? Um, initially to be completely honest, um, when they first came out with the race, I was like, Oh, I'm going to win this thing. This is like perfect for me. I, I, right love street. I love this type of weather. And then it was about two or three weeks after they finally announced that they were actually doing it. I saw a Facebook post with Robert Killian saying, Hey, I'm going to Iceland. Going, Shit. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> you know, and then, and then other athletes started coming. My, my teammate from uh world's toughest motor, Mark Jones, Said he was going to be there. Um, I have a good friend, David Dietrich, who's from Austria. He's an amazing endurance athlete. I'm like, man, this is it's going to be a hard race now. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing also is, you know, with ultra distance races, you have no the guy who won second place at this race had never ran a Spartan race before. Yeah, that was that was a That's nice little crazy. <laughs> that was a nice headline I saw when they announced it. This was his first obstacle course race. But, but at the same time, this guy's from, like, the Czech Republic. He's, like, literally tough as nails, and he's won, like, 135-mile races. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. never know. That, that's, so it's right of history as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But at the same time, usually the first time of the obstacles and then all the burpees and the penalties tends to throw those runners off their game a bit. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Because yeah, they're that's... definitely not used to that. Because in a 135 mile race, chances are he never did any burpees. <laughs> exactly. I'm just guessing. 
It's and then true. he sees Olympus for the first time ever and goes, you want me to what? <laughs> oh, well, I, even, I mean, I, I was, you know, I like, kind of chatting with them, like, after the race, and they were saying, like, even the monkey bars. He just, he couldn't figure out the monkey bars. You know, something as simple as that, that, you know, like, what what us athletes that do a lot of obstacle course races, you know, we're used to that stuff. Even a rope climb. Like, I've been in the shorter races where, you know, like, you know, I, I remember actually last year we were doing a sprint and my, my teammate Miles Bartlett, we're chatting and this kid's like way ahead of us. And he's like, his buddy was like, oh, he can run a 5K in like 1530 or something like that. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, let's wait till we get to the rope climb. And I get there. Yep. And the, you know, he, he doesn't know how to do it. So, <laughs> yeah, those are the, those are the people where the Herkhoist is the, the great equalizer oh, from us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, um, yeah. that's that's the best part about obstacle course racing is that it finds your weaknesses and you have to be an all around athlete. That's what I love about it. Well, yeah. and doing it over and over, you learn different techniques. Yeah. I can almost guarantee you, you don't climb the rope the same now as you did a year and a half ago because you oh. learn new techniques along the way and you figure out how to make it faster, how to make it more efficient, etc. If you're brand new to it, you know nothing about efficiency on obstacles. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that, that's great. No matter whether it's, you know, a short sprint course, you know, a shorter race um, or like, you know, something like this, that's a 25 hour race. It's all about like obstacle efficiency. You wonder how many obstacles he failed, even coming in second place. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, he was doing a lot of burpees. I know, I know that much, but that's why I get absolute major props. <laughs> um, but yeah, all right, was, go, Josh. And, you know, the other thing I think is I. Uh, so we look at, you know, 2017 and before, the Ultra Beast is essentially just two laps of a beast, right? So you've got people that are doing 26 to 30 miles, depending on the course, and they're only doing, you know, the bucket carry twice. They're only doing sandbag carries twice, the rope climb twice. So now, 2018 and forward, Spartan has this new format, right? And and in Iceland, you guys did, so you mentioned before we started recording, how many bucket carries did you do? So, uh, so I did 11 laps total, so that was 11 bucket carries, and there are two sandbag carries, so I did 22 sandbag 22. carries. 22. Oh, so, Yeah. <laughs> I'm still so a total of <laughs> 33 heavy carries over the course of a 24-hour period. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you think about some of the bucket carries we've done at, at these courses, whether it's Killington or Palmerton or wherever it is, right? And, and you finish the bucket carry once – and yeah. inevitably the day after people like that was the worst bucket carry I've ever done in my life. Now, oh, by the way, you have to do it 11 times. So, And you're doing it on ice in freezing cold weather. And did they provide you guys with pre-weighed buckets? Were they sealed so, and everything? Yeah. The, the, I, I, I know this is going to sound like, like the bucket carry wasn't as hard as your re- regular bucket carry. Um, <laughs> So because it was that. lighter or because it was shorter distance or was, combination? Yeah, so it was actually a combination of that. You did – so it did have an uphill. It did have a downhill. There wasn't, like, the steepness that you would find either, either like, Killington, New Jersey, things like that. Um, they were pre-filled as well. Um, okay. They also – a lot of them actually had a cap on them, which is very nice. You know, like, if you actually, like, buy a bucket of paint and it actually has a cap on it. Yeah. Um, so you could actually hold it instead of, you know, holding like this, you could actually flip it and hold it like that and kind of switch different positions so you could use different muscles. Um, at least that for me, I mean, maybe there were some people that just held it like this the entire time, but I was able to switch from here to switch, you know, to the other arm. So the rocks were on, you know, like one side and then switch to here and just try different things. So I wasn't tiring out all my muscles. Um, That's cool. It also so- keeps the rain out for making it exactly, unintentionally yeah. heavier. Yeah. Well, well at initially, and then over a while, something, I don't know, maybe people were eating the caps or something, but they started disappearing. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So there well, were actually some buckets that you would grab that were like, and just like any other sparring race, if you take the extra, or any race actually, even like Fit Challenge, like I'll tell people this, that if you take the extra couple of seconds to find like the good one, you know, yeah. take, yep. you know, because... Instead of just running into it, and especially in like the competitive heats and grabbing the first one, you're like, oh my God, why did I grab the log that's, you know, like this <laughs> thick? Instead of grabbing the yep. log that's this thick. Um, so it definitely, it, it, it definitely helped taking an extra couple of seconds to find like the good one. 
Yeah, by lap seven at fit, if there was a twig in that pile of wood, I was taking the yeah. twig. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something Ross to be said about good, picking man. carefully. <laughs> I said <it> fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how do you? So how do you feel about this format of race? This this shorter course, multi lap after World Toughest Modder, and then this versus the longer distance single transition event. What what do you prefer between the two? Ah, uh, that, that's it's kind of tricky because. I think I do really well with the shorter loops, but I tech, I personally for ultra distance stuff, I I like a better just long longer course, mm-hmm. you know, like from transition point A to point B. Um, but I don't know. I think they both have their fun parts, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's it, it's different because you know you get into um, you know if you look at the ultra beast. I remember my first ultra distance race your mindset is totally what really gets you through the race. Like you can, you can walk 30 miles, you know, without really any training, but it's really, it's all inside your head. It's, do you want to keep going? Do you have the willpower to keep going? Or at the transition point, are you like, I can just go to the bar. It's right down the street and it's so much easier. So now, now you have these courses and it's, you know, like fit last year, you're seeing the transition point every three, four miles. And it's, it's, One, it's a great morale boost, but at the same time, it's also an easy way for you to say, I've been here before, I could check out and just be done with it and and not have to go through that course again. So it's it's interesting to see the mindset versus, you know, the the different distances and the races. So Yeah, I think um I think Fit Challenge actually, you know, and I I have to give a big shout out to Rock because that's honestly one of my favorite races. Um is and I've done it numerous times, especially the multi lap is I think the multi-lap helped me out immensely in these type of races, both World Toughest Mudder and the Iceland race, because mm-hmm. it got me used to that kind of mental toughness of saying, okay, oh, wait, I'm already done. Oh, wait, no, I got to do another one. Oh, wait, now I got to do another one and another one and another one. So <laughs> um, it definitely helped out quite a bit. And so now that we've talked the actual race, let's talk some non-race stuff. So you finish – the world championship you Ah. win the race and you decide that that's not a big enough achievement for the weekend so so what happens next so yeah it was funny actually i was actually just asked this um yesterday like you know did you actually already have this plan like you know in your head that you were gonna ask your girlfriend to marry you at the end of this race um initially when and you guys probably know this when they first came out with the idea for this race they weren't actually saying that they were doing the race Right. They're just like, ah, you know, if we get enough people, we might do it. So initially, I told my girlfriend about it because I saw it pop up. And I actually, I'm in um, PA school right now, so I wasn't able to do World Stuff as Mudder like I thought it was going to do again. Um, team up with my teammate, Mark Jones. So I'm like, wait, but I have the entire month of December off from clinical, so this is going to work out perfectly. So I tell my girl, and the first thing she says to me is, no, I'm not going <laughs> she's like she had already been she'd been to the death race with me like she knows what these ultra events are like and how tolling it is she's like no i don't want to go so i convinced her into it being a vacation i was like you know what I don't take some this. vacation you know? <laughs> we've all done that with our respective significant yeah. others right it's hey i yeah. want to do this race but let me tell you the great reasons you should come <laughs> it's only 24 hours out of the way the rest of the time yeah, he was exactly um and i think that <laughs> See, I think i'm the girl i get that perspective <laughs> <laughs> i think the way that i was able to actually make this went over with her was that i was like well we'll get there before the race so that i won't be beat up i won't care about you know anything like we'll still be able to see the sights i won't be banged up um so once i convinced her with that up that's when I started getting the idea in my head. We've been together for five years. I thought, you know what, Iceland, it's going to be beautiful. I'll, you know, ask her to marry me in front of the, you know, the, the um, lights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. And then, but then as the race started coming up, I'm like, you know what, that's been done before. Maybe I should do something different. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, people have, you know, like gone engaged at the races and whatnot. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to try and win that race. And then I'm going to propose to her. <laughs> <laughs> no so what pressure. if you hadn't won? Would you still have proposed? Uh, so I, I, I still would have done it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still would have done it. And honestly, I still would have been a winner. So, 
Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's she has five years. You've been trained well. Good job. Well, so it's funny. So Josh wins the race, proposes to his girlfriend. Uh, so the female winner, Morgan Mackay, wins <laughs> yes. the race, and her boyfriend proposes to her. So the trend oh is God, now wait. set. If anybody uh, is single that wins this event, your next over. obligation immediately after winning is to get engaged. <laughs> you, you know what's going to happen? All like the uh, you know girlfriends of any guys that want to actually, or anybody that wants to run <laughs> this race, if another, they're going to be like, "Hey, you should run that race, honey. Go, go <laughs> that. That you that need to time. win that." <laughs> did you carry the ring the whole race, or did someone slip yes. into you? You did. You yep. did. Yeah, that was um. So yeah, no. <laughs> You weren't terrified of losing it? I figured somebody slipped it to you as you were running through at the yeah. end. No, so that way you got ten feet to search instead of six and a half yeah. miles. <laughs> so the funny part about that was actually so what I did was I had the Solomon um S um S Lab pack, yeah. which has a zipper on the back, and it comes with an emergency blanket. So the emergency blanket is nice and flat and it's inside a ziplock bag. So I'm like, this is perfect. I'm going to put it, and I open up the Ziploc bag before the race, put the ring inside of there. I'm like, this is safe. I'm not going to use this thing. You know, like I have another emergency blanket in my pit. So then it goes into a pocket behind the zipper. So it was like perfect. It was a nice, safe place, at least, you know, in my mind. <laughs> Even though looking back on it now, everybody's asking me, I'm like, man. We, we can all see the floor <laughs> in this plan. <laughs> Josh, if you're, he was able to see my face when he said that out loud, which is part of why he was laughing, because I was like, are you kidding me? Uh. So what happened was the la the final part of the course basically had the spear throw and then uh, the final bucket, I mean, excuse me, the uh, sandbag carry. And then you ran around the transition area to the final obstacles, which was a sled drag. Um, the Hercules hoist, the bridge, and then your burpees, and then the multi-rig. So what happened was Nathan uh, Oil, my team captain of Nor'easter, I actually caught up with him because he was running the open heat. So we're running around the TA, and I'm like, oh, crap. I'm like, Nathan, you got to get this ring out of my backpack for me. <laughs> so he's literally just about to grab my backpack, and we both stopped. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, you can't have any help from anybody else. Oh. Right? You know, Sparring race. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, there's probably like somebody is gonna see and be like, oh, he was helping him out with his backpack and <laughs> he was taking weight so, off. Like, of. really, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm like, and then I get to the obstacle. Of course, I see you already outside because um, they had already announced that I was coming in. So I'm like, great. How am I gonna get my ring on my bag now? <laughs> so I actually. <laughs> Got it out initially, and Matt Davis was there. He was actually announcing the, um, for me as I came in. And I'm like, Matt, can you get this for me? And he he can't get it open because my hands were frozen at that point. He couldn't get the Ziploc bag open. So he gave it to this other guy, Mark, and Mark just rips the thing, and the thing was <gasps> flying. <laughs> the emergency <laughs> blanket. <laughs> so of course I'm thinking frozen ground, frozen white ground, White gold diamond ring. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to find this thing. Oh my god! And she she's standing over the other side of the finish line, wondering what the hell you're up to. Yeah. Oh, everybody was. I, 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 mean, I did tell a couple of people about it. Um, uh. when it like, but <laughs> so we're looking. Finally, I look down. My backpack is sitting right below my feet, and that's the ring is just sitting right there on top of my backpack. Oh. I grabbed. <laughs> It. Karma. It was karma. So oh, you, you you need to start filling the bank again, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I definitely do. Um, and basically, my whole plan was actually, even before this happened, was to kind of stumble across the finish line and pretend, like, and, you know, kind of get my girlfriend, baby, come over here. I'm about to pass out and then drop to one knee. But instead, yeah. I was like, hey, come over here. And she expected me to hug her. And I, that's when I dropped and asked her the question. So. Nice. <laughs> Tough to top that one. That's that's a good one. So congratulations. Yes, on both, congratulations. On both yes. Um, <laughs> so next year, obviously you're going back, I assume, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we generally do at the end of our uh, show is take some questions from the audience. Usually they're for us, as you can imagine. There's yeah. not a single question for us tonight. 
Um, so <laughs> I ask <laughs> you. I mean, you're welcome to ask questions, but I can't imagine any of them would be as interesting. Um, so, Paul, if you have them, I, I know we got a handful of them, so maybe we can lightning round a couple questions because we do. Seems like a a lot of people obviously want some input from you. Yeah. Yeah, no, a lot of the questions we've gone over, such as the, uh, when are you running for president and did you carry the ring the whole way? <laughs> um, so one of the, uh, so uh, Jeffrey Miller, he, his question was, tell us everything. So, you know, digging into that a little bit more, it's, it's one of his things is kind of um, the mindset of going into it thinking I'm going to win versus I'm just going to finish. Like, obviously you went into this knowing when you first went into this, knowing your competition, and then as you saw more and more people join up, how did you kind of mentally shift from, I'm just going to go, have fun, finish, to I'm going to beat these guys? Yeah, so it was, I think the biggest mentality actually was running my own race. Um, and I know, I know that sounds, you know, everybody always says that all the time, but it's so hard not to do that, especially when you're running competitively. You know, you, you keep thinking, okay, you know, like, Oh, well, what's he doing? What what is you know? Is he running faster? I need to run that pace, or yeah. you know, that person's gaining on me. I need to run faster. And it did you really... mentally have an idea of where everybody was all the time? Like, well, they're ahead of me now, but they've got more burpees. Or did you did you yeah. have that mental mental so, track the whole time? I was I was actually in first the entire time. Actually, oh, so it was even very harder. Cool. Actually, it was actually when it, there there was this guy Sebastian who was with me for the first couple of laps, but. I'm not really sure what happened to him, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think he actually was finishing the race properly like he should have been, and that's all I kind of know about that. But okay. uh, with the with the guys behind me, I knew that they were a good distance, at least like 15 to 30 minutes. But 15 minutes is nothing. No. In like a 25 mm -hmm. minutes. No. Yeah, especially not when you've got the potential of you know 120 burpees or something like that. Yep. So even even when I did like the 120 burpees, for example, like. We actually, um, Rich Bugatti actually of uh, Mount Strength Cross from me yep. and him were actually talking about this earlier today because he's he sought me out immensely as like he I used to coach with him. He helped coach me kind of with the mental aspect of this of this sport. Is if something goes wrong, you can't beat up yourself about it. You just you acknowledge it and you move on. And yeah. for example, like with the 120 burpee penalty lap. Um, it was horrible. I was like, you know, oh man, I just fell another obstacle. Just fell another one. Man, those guys are going to catch up to me now. So instead of going into the burpee pit, as I said, because you have to do 120 in a row, I was like, I could have easily just got like really stressed out and flat, you know, just flustered and started just banging out, his, you know, tons of burpees at once. Yeah, I'm burning. But I thought, this, you know what? this is a 24 hour race. I got plenty of time. Yeah. So and I, how yeah. long did 120 burpees take you, by the way? It, well, I, I don't even know because, you know, I just did it nice and relaxed. I was like, I did 10 burpees, I waited for a couple of seconds. Did another 10 burpees, waited a couple of seconds. And just kept doing that until they were done. Um, and you really just have to run your own race in that. Um, but as we got to the end, though, I was like, I started thinking more like, I could actually win this thing. You know, it's still, winning is still a foreign thing to me. I was not an athlete when I was a kid. I was far from being an athlete when I was a kid. <laughs> I was, you know, that kid that sat on the bench for like four years of like, you know, playing high school and uh, football and things like that. So it wasn't really until the end of the race that I thought, I'm going to actually win this thing. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. So it's still, it's, I'm still coming to terms with it myself. So, so with, um... and I think that's one of the things that people notice about you, Josh, is that you're so humble isn't quite the right word because you, yes, you are humble, but you're so positive about everything and you know hey i'm just out here doing my thing and i i know that there are a lot of people out who have a great great deal of respect for you and a lot of it is not only your achievements but also your attitude about it and your thankfulness for the other people who are there and your encouragement of others i know you've passed me a bunch of times at various things and you always have a kind word to say and a you know hey keep going good job and and that sort of thing and uh just want to say that people notice that and people appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd be willing to bet that you're like a lot of us where that's really more important. It is. Um, and we did have one person specifically who said, give a shout out to my pal, Josh. I'm assuming it's safe to use names if they told us to. And so <laughs> Kathy, she says, uh, give a shout out to my pal, Josh. For me, he did an amazing job. So 
I love hearing that. <laughs> that that honestly, that actually fuels me more than anything. More that fuels me more than winning any races or you know like being seen as like the you know Spartan Ultra World Champion and stuff like that. Like see, like like I, I mean, you could see I'm wearing my Boulder Dash like fine. <laughs> yep. Um, if you guys noticed by now. Um, this is uh, the Find Your Bull team. I don't know if you guys have heard of that team or not. But, yeah, um, Lynn, Lynn's been on the show talking like, about it before when she first founded it. Uh, yeah, Lynn's one of my favorite people in the world. And um, it, the Find Your Bull team is basically people that have dealt with either physical, mental, any type of like, you know, like either challenges in their life. And they all come together and run obstacle course races. And I, I think about those people when I'm doing like these type of races, like my friends, my friend Andrew, who I met through that team, who, you know, struggled with so much in his life, but he just keeps going. Like, that's awesome. That, that I think, like, when I'm fueled by that kind of stuff, like, it, it helps out so much with these races. It really does. And seeing people like you out there, like, like when I pass people on the I know it's when I pass people on there, but even when I'm being passed by the people, it's like, it, it it makes you actually go further and makes you actually run harder when you see other people on the course and they're they're doing just as well as you are so so what yeah. does 2018 hold um so 2018 actually it's, it's a good question because in the past my racing was kind of all over the place you know like i'd run like a sprint course i would run this race i would run sure. that race well you're in school um, right are you still in it, school yeah so um basically still going to be training it's mm -hmm. when it comes to racing i'm going to actually be putting almost all of my kind of focus into endurance events um with school i'm actually still in clinical so i actually graduated in august um and then hopefully be landing an er job sometime after that so hopefully if you, so if anybody gets hurt around the courses hopefully i won't see you in the emergency room but <laughs> <laughs> But at least, at least you'll know what they've been through. So, well, actually, maybe it's a good thing. Actually, I'll be able to relate to them though. <laughs> and um, so, and I'm going to ask this selfishly. So, you're going to shift a lot of your focus to the endurance side of the racing. What's a what's a typical workout week for you look like? So, what what do you focus on as far as you know? Do you have a minimum miles you try and get for the week? Like, what's what's Josh Fiore's kind of workout plan on a weekly basis? Yeah. So it, it, running is the main focus, um, and it's usually Damn it. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I know, you knew he was going to say like, that. How do you become really good at endurance? It's like, how do you become really good at running? I don't you know. run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, that, but that being said, though, actually, every single one of my running workouts has a purpose to it. Um, a lot of people just kind of like just go out and run. It's like, oh, I'm going to run three miles today. Maybe I'll do like five the next day or whatever. Um, I only run four times a week, generally. It's only. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, some of my friends run every single day. Um, I have a lot of friends that do that. And <clears throat> two, at least, like, two to three of my workouts are very, like, focused. So it's doing intervals on, like, a treadmill. It's doing, like, you know, like a good warm-up and then just doing, like, heavy carries up and down a hill or a mountain. Um, and then the long runs are usually on the weekend. The thing that I actually changed with this race, and I learned this just by reading a couple like ultra endurance books um, or ultra marathon books, was doing two back to back long runs. So on Saturday and Sunday, I would do like 50 miles on Saturday and then follow up by 50 miles on Sunday. And then 20 and 20, 20 and 25 and 25, 30 and 30. So basically, by the time I was leading up to the race, I was running about like 60 to 70 miles a week. Um, and then, but it's also a lot of hiking, as you know, like a lot of the courses have steep mountains, so there's a lot of hiking in there. And then on top of that, I do a lot of like cycling in the gym, like cross training, um, and then a lot of just like body weight and rock climbing. And that's really it. And not what really it, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> and then family, son, school yeah. all that other stuff so yeah yeah it's it's it was hard i mean and it's still i mean it's you know getting up at four or five o'clock in the morning on the weekends to so i could do my long runs so that it doesn't go into my family time mm -hmm. um so it yeah. was definitely it was hard um and on the weekends you know it was or on the weekdays 
it was getting up at like four o'clock in the morning to do a workout and then go to school or go to clinicals so I could spend time with my family. So it was definitely, it was. In addition to the physical training that that does, that's a big part of the mental training too, is that whole philosophy of, you know, got to get it done. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And And of course that's a big difference between the people who, you know, are successful and those who just dream about it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. Exactly. I, I will keep dreaming. That's, <laughs> that's, that's gonna be my I don't dream. even dream about it because my whole motivation is different. <laughs> yeah. It makes a big difference. <laughs> Think. All right. All right. Anything else? No, the only other question uh, Chase, is full. We have one question here for you. That's right. It'll take us you away from for me. talking to Josh. So. Yes, there is one question here for you. So uh, do do we switch Josh's now? Sure. sure. <laughs> I right. don't know how I'm going to follow that up, but what is it? Well, Mr. Chase, they want to know uh, about your experience trying out for Survivor. That was last weekend or last <laughs> week? It was the middle of the week. Uh, it's easy. I just lied and said I was Josh Fiore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no I'll, I'll spend about 10 seconds on this really quick. So if you ever want to try out to be on any reality TV show, um, what they do for Survivor is you go somewhere and you wait in line. for. I waited in line for about three hours. And they put you in front of a camera and they say, you've got 60 seconds. Tell us why you think you'd be good on Survivor. Tell us about yourself. Tell us a story. Say whatever the hell you want, ultimately. Um, and then you'll never hear from us again is, is really what it comes down to. So, um, so yeah, I, I drove down to Mohegan Sun last week. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm excellent at that part. So I, I could get rejected for reality TV like the best of them. Um, yeah, I've, I've been trying out for Survivor since the days of having to film on a camcorder and a VHS tape. Um, luckily, those were the days that were also before YouTube. So that no longer exists. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah. So uh, if anybody out there has any contacts or pull with folks at CBS that can get me on Survivor, or if you want to join me for The Amazing Race, I'll do either of them. So. One of the top three. Okay, so I've only watched this show when I've been at my mother's house or my sister's house, and they insist on having it on. So I'm quite thankful that you're not going to be on it, because then I would have to watch it, and I really don't want to do that. Because there's nothing more miserable than sitting and watching an hour of Survivor. Uh, I take it back. Anything having to do with a Kardashian. Would yeah, be I was going to say, maybe the Kardashian version of Survivor. <laughs> but uh, one of the one of the top three, I know because I'm at my mom's house and she watched the season finale, finale was the other night. Yeah, and she tried out for 16 years. Yeah, yeah. So I still got a long ways to go before I even get a call back at this point. So, <laughs> but why? I don't, I don't think it'll be in the cards. So why not? It's you know, it's it's you know, <laughs> look at what look at what Josh does. So we started out by racing these two and three mile mud runs. Right. And then that turned into running supers and that turned into running beasts. And now last year I went super heavy on ultra beasts. It's just, I think everybody starts to progress at some point in their life into something else. So me, the logical procession. (laughs) Paul, I got left behind. What about you? 26 mile race. Yeah, me too. 38 days on an Island. So, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where I think, I think, the the survival aspect of survivor really is not a thing at all but i to me the mental aspect of a game like that i think is is a huge attraction to me and i would i would love to just be the ringleader of a bunch of chuckleheads on an island somewhere that have no <laughs> social graces whatsoever so uh, just so you know my mother is sitting next to me and she just said oh my god he would be perfect for that right show. see <laughs> so you got my mom's vote the so nanas you, of the world I, love you me. watched all of them She's seen all of them. Yeah, so have I. So. This is going See, sideways a little. I can never be on that show because I don't know how to lie very well. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm really bad at it, as Josh can tell. Thankfully, the one time I lied to him, he didn't press me on it because I had nothing. Well, to tell your mom, because I would I would be a better, less good-looking Malcolm, and she'll know exactly what, what I mean by that. So. <laughs> You're getting a good laugh. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's going totally right, sideways. But you should talk to our favorite Englishman in Florida, Mr. Garfield Griffith, because he's been on one of those many moons ago. Mm. And every really? now and then, yeah, and every now and then, one of his on his Facebook feed, somebody shares an old article or an old photo from those days, and we all get a good chuckle at it. On Survivor or Survivor like something like it, maybe he was on okay. Naked and Afraid. 
<laughs> Great. Now I've got that mental picture. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All right. Let's Sunday, move on to the finish. Some, Anybody else have anything else? Uh, TV news, right? Uh, I do want to put a small plug in. The world's toughest mutter uh, TV show is on. Well, it'll be on today for those of you who are listening to this on the 23rd, considering we are taping it very late on the mm -hmm. 22nd um, at <clears throat> noon Eastern, 11 o'clock where I am here in Texas. And um, it should be fun to watch. Are you in it? Yeah. I'm I don't home. expect to be on it except for maybe in the background somewhere running along. Yeah. I didn't trip and fall on my face at any point. So at least I know that there's probably oh. nothing that's going to. That, that that's you're already winning at uh world selfish mother if you haven't fallen <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't going fast enough <laughs> I, I, did, uh, I really wish i was there i look forward to definitely being there in november they did it last year and the production quality was pretty good of it so if you oh, yeah. uh oh, they did a phenomenal job they if didn't, you haven't they didn't seen your team, team enough but uh. <laughs> <laughs> well now that you're a, a winner in Spartan, I'm sure you're going to get some serious, uh, serious coverage from here on out. So now, now you've got all eyes on you, so you can't avoid it. Don't trip and fall on your face. Yeah, well, now that you just said that, now I'm going to trip over my own feet at the start line. <laughs> well, you can blame it on Paul. Oh, there thanks. Yep. We all do. I mean, that it's you know what went wrong. Oh, Paul did it. Yeah, it's pretty true, actually. All right. Although, quite honestly, right before we hit record, we were discussing my fault at most. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anything else for the night, guys? No other questions. I don't think we can top that. Well, in that case, uh, for everyone listening, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, etc., etc. Whatever it is you're and celebrating, to, uh, have a good one. Yeah. Mr. Fiore, the uh, first annual Spartan Race Ultra World Champion, thanks for joining us, and uh, good luck with uh, winter time and next season and everything it brings. Yeah, thanks Congratulations. We look forward to watching it. Thank you. As always, guys, thanks so much for checking out the show. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear what you think, so give us some feedback. Submit a question, share a story from one of your recent races or events. Uh, you know, I think the show gets better and better with your participation, and it's not just Paul, Sandy, and myself talking. So to reach out, ask questions, suggest a topic, you know, whatever it may be, follow along on Facebook. We've got a dedicated Any Spotten Show page, or you can join the community at Any Spotten's on Facebook as well. Twitter's your thing. Shoot us a tweet at Any Spotten's. Uh, and if you want to find our full library of episodes, uh, I'd recommend either iTunes or Stitcher. So again, for uh, Paul, Sandy, myself, thanks so much for listening, and uh, until next time.